Welcome everybody to our Sunday worship time. And today for the sermon, we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to interview Sheila Bomplin and she's going to share her thoughts with us. We've been working as a church through this book, Anchors for the Soul by John Mark Hicks. And we're about to wrap it up. Uh, the last few chapters talk about how we respond to people who are suffering and when to speak and when to be quiet. And when we do speak, what to say and what not to say. Some real practical tips that John Mark Hicks has shared with us. So let me introduce Sheila to you. Sheila grew up in Arkansas. She's been in Memphis for about 25 years. And she spent some time as uh, doing mission work in Florence, Italy, which I just can't imagine living there for several years and, and doing anything, mission work or whatever. But I love that city, except for the mosquitoes. And uh, <laughs> she's also been to Croatia. She married uh, she, uh, a man from Croatia, uh, Drajan. And um, they spent three years in Croatia uh, during the war. And that wartime experience led her to pursue a degree in counseling from Harding School of Theology. And uh, I think that's where Sheila and I met. She now works as a licensed marriage and family therapist in private practice and has helped several of our church members on different occasions. And um, she and her husband are getting ready to move back to Croatia. And I know some of her clients that I know personally are not happy with you, Sheila, and they're going to really miss you because you've really been instrumental in, in helping them with some uh, different issues. And after that, Sheila got her doctor of ministry in spiritual formation at Lipscomb University, which incidentally is where John Mark Hick, Hicks teaches mm -hmm. now. And uh, so she's got this counseling experience and she's got this spiritual formation experience. It's a great combination. That's why we like to send people to Sheila to, for counseling and, and for wisdom. She also loves music and she teaches piano, she sings. Sheila and I did a concert a few years ago. Uh, she sings with Rhodes College um, Meister Singers uh, Chorale. Oh, I used Memphis, to. <laughs> used to, when nobody's singing right now, right? And the Memphis Chamber Choir, and we did a concert together in downtown uh, a few years ago. Actually, yeah, more like 10 years ago, I think. And uh, so, we have a lot of uh, similarities, a lot of connections, and she really believes that music has a lot to teach us about spiritual formation and how to grow through suffering. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer and, and turn things over to Sheila and uh, invite you to pray with us. God, thank you so much for how you put people in our lives to help us better understand ourselves, to better understand you, to better understand this world around us and how we can uh, not just survive, but thrive in the midst of pain and suffering. And I thank you for our time together. Would you bless us, Lord? Bless Sheila as she shares from her wisdom and from her experience. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you. And I want to thank you for inviting me. And, you know, as I was thinking about all these connections, I realized there's another connection, and that is that I actually met John Mark Hicks when we lived in Croatia. He came over there during that, that time that we lived there and I think did a seminar with the church, you know, and so that was the first time we met him. I believe he spent the night in our house while he was there. Um, so this is just a neat set of connections in a lot of different ways. Um, I do want to say that because of what we're talking about, uh, I just want to out the outset say, I know whatever I have to say is, is not going to be perfect. And because we're talking about suffering and people are coming to this from different places who may be suffering through something right now, um, I just want to ask your forgiveness if something I say doesn't fit for you or even steps on your toes or something, because that's so, it's so possible for us to do without even meaning to. And so I just want to say that up front. Please forgive me if that happens. Um, so we were going to start today with the video, right? Yeah. Okay. We'll go ahead and watch that now. And I'll just say, there used to be a video online of this that didn't have the, the translation, but it's not there anymore. So we have, a, I believe, Portuguese subtitles <laughs> for an English video. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. I think it's very, very important to discover what is silence. Silence is not only not talking, Silence is more deeper because the great noise is inside ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, 
our wonderful students, dear friends, I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's talk by a very special guest. Even in our churches, there is too much noise. So it's not a place where we can encounter God silently. Silence makes man more similar to God because God, I said, is silence. He talks in silence. Uh, we encounter him in silence. And if we remain with God, we become silent. What makes the Cardinal's insights most pointed, authentic, and valuable is that they were shaped not just in the face of the indifference, skepticism, and ridicule that religious believers all too often encounter in secular society, but also in the teeth of the far more sinister and formidable opposition offered in his youth by a Marxist dictatorship in his native Guinea. I think why the Western countries today are no, no believers, are less believers, because they are every time talking. They know no silence, and the faith is going down. Silence is really the moment where I construct myself as a human being related to God. And without God and without silence, we are lost. What are we doing here? In other words, what are our lives for? What kind of people are we called to be? The Western society seems to be lost because when we are cut from God, we are lost. It's like a tree without roots. It's like a river without the fountains. God is our fountain. If we are cut from God, we are lost. And God is silent. Well, that was interesting. Um, a lot about silence. Don't have enough silence in my life. I know I don't. I have a two-year-old and four-year-old at my house. So I know there's not enough silence. And I'm, I have ADD. I mean, I, I run away from silence. But what does this have to do with how we can come along people who are suffering? Well, that's a good question. Um, and I can see how it wouldn't be an automatic connection for people, perhaps. But as, as the, the Cardinal was pointing out, we live in a very noisy culture. We just have noise and distractions everywhere. You know, there were books written back in the, the 60s about how fast paced our life was and, and how things were just getting busier and busier. That was the 60s. <laughs> how many years have passed since then? It's only gotten more and more so with technology and all. Um, the most recent thing that annoys me greatly is you can't get gasoline in a lot of places without the screen popping up and then it, it's loud. You know, they give you the news or advertisements or whatever. Um, and then we have our, our cell phones, which are way more than a phone, and they open up this whole world of noise and distractions to us. And, and so we, I think we need to stop and think sometimes. This is not the way life has been for millennia. This is a fairly recent thing that we live in so much noise and distraction. Um, and we're not responsible for having been born in this time and place, but we are responsible to deal with living in this time and place and to not just give in to it and let it distract us infinitely. Um, and part of the problem with this noise all around us is that we also have noise within us. And as the Cardinal said in the video, the greatest noise is inside ourselves. And you have to get some measure of quiet outside to begin dealing with that noise inside. There are things we can do to do that, but it, it it won't happen without that. Um, and there's been writing throughout the centuries, um, the millennia of the Christian faith about the importance of, of making time to be quiet, making time to be with God in that quiet place in our hearts. So the video connects with what we're talking about because so much of what John Mark said in his writing on this topic is the importance of learning how to sit with people in pain and not feel the need to talk and not feel the need to explain things, not feel the need to distract them from the pain. Uh, we need to be able to sit quietly with people and hear their stories, hear their words, or just be quiet with them. 
And the difficult thing is that you can't just automatically do that because you heard somebody say, you need to be able to do this. It doesn't just come automatically. It takes practice. Um, there's an author named Parker Palmer that you may be familiar with. I don't know. Mm -hmm. In one of his books, he writes about, um, well, he's writing about a lot of things, but in this part of it, he's talking about how do you connect with the soul of a person? And he says the soul is like a wild animal. And anyone who's spent much time outside knows that a wild animal is not going to come out and be around you if you're making noise and, you know, crashing through the woods or talking or whatever. You know, you have to be still and be quiet to get that animal to trust enough to come out. And he says our souls are like that. Um, people don't just open up to anybody in any time or place. It takes a certain amount of trust that this person can handle it. You know, this person can be with me because they know how to be quiet and they know how to wait and they know how to just be. And so, um, so I, th I thought the video was really a good way to start off because he's emphasizing that importance of making time for silence and also that silence is the way we connect with God. Um, and he says God is silent. And I know some people are like, what on earth does that mean? Because God obviously speaks. But most of what we experience God doing in our own selves is in the quiet of our hearts. We don't hear audible voices from God. Um, it's something that happens in our mind, in our hearts, in the quiet. And if we're constantly distracted or constantly listening to outside noises, we won't ever hear that. And I think that when we are wanting to be with people in their suffering, having a really deep, strong connection to God inside ourselves is one of the best ways to be able to do that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But that's why the video. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And uh, I may get be getting ahead of where you're going, but when you're talking about silence and I need to get away and be quiet, I mean, I think of Jesus who mm -hmm. multiple times over and over, he was getting away from the noise and the and the hubbub of everything going so he could be along with God. Right, yeah. right. And he did that at those crucial points in his life for sure. And it sounds like it was a habit. It was something he did very regularly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about how, how music can uh, be a part of this. What does music have to do with this? Okay. Images? All right. Um, yeah, I honestly don't remember how that came into my mind, but I think it's just so much a part of life that, that it, it did. <laughs> and so here it is. Um, Music has beginnings and endings, and it has a lot of transitions in between. And so I was thinking about that, like, you know, when I'm with a client or with a friend and they're going through a really hard time, it, it helps to think this is a part of their story or a part of their song. And there are parts of music that can be really dissonant um, and other parts that can be really harmonious and, and, and beautiful. And a lot of times if you, play one of those dissonant chords by itself. I mean, there's some songs that, that I really like, but they have certain chords in them. And if I hear just that chord, just like, oh, I can't stand it, you know? <laughs> but when you put that really dissonant part of the music in the context of the whole piece, um, so you get to actually build up to it and then you get to eventually hear a resolution, it can be absolutely beautiful. Um, there's one piece, I wish we could play it, but it's the uh, O Magnum Mysterium by Morton Lauritsen. And most of the song is just absolutely harmoniously gorgeous. But he puts this one chord in a couple of times where the words are referring to the pain that Mary is going to feel because of what Jesus is going to suffer in his death. And so right at those parts in the music, he has this really dissonant chord. And if you just heard that chord, it wouldn't be beautiful. But when you put it in the context of the whole piece, it's really powerful and really beautiful. And so I think it can be helpful when someone in our lives is suffering or when we're the one going through the suffering, um, just to have that, that idea of this is part of the music, but it's not all of the music. And God is a composer of our lives and he is working to bring all these things together and make beauty out of it. And so, um, that's part of what I had in mind. And also just because silence is so much a part of music and we forget that, mm -hmm. but, um, okay. There's pop music that doesn't have any silence. <laughs> um, but when you look at most, um, serious music, whether you want to call it classical music or some other period, 
um, it's always a combination of sounds and silence. And the silences can be really important and really, you know, powerful in the music. So um, I was just thinking about that and, and what John Mark had written in these couple of chapters, you know, just that the power of silence, it's, it's so important and yet it's so neglected. We don't think about it much. Um, also, I was thinking, you know, with music, nobody learns to play music or to sing music unless they first learn to be quiet and listen. You know, you, you listen to your teacher playing or singing, you listen to your teacher explaining things to you, you listen to groups performing, and you learn to listen to your own playing so that you can get better at it. And so just developing the ability to still your spirit, be quiet, and listen is a huge part of music, and it's a huge part of helping people. You know, something that Richard Foster wrote in his book, Celebration of Discipline, a long time ago, he said, the desperate need today is not for a greater number of intelligent people or gifted people, but for deep people. And I really believe he's right. And especially people who are suffering, they need people they can be with that are deep enough to make room for that suffering and to make room for the words they need to get out. And so um, learning to be quiet is an essential part of growing into the depth of our own minds and hearts and spirits and growing into the depth of our relationship with God. Um, and all of this connects with music in my mind too because I, I remember so well in high school going to my piano teacher and I'd been working on a piece and I was able to listen to it but I couldn't play it and I remember going to her and saying Mrs. White I know how this is supposed to sound but I can't do it what's the matter? <laughs> and she said, well, Sheila, if everybody could play a piece just by listening to it and knowing and how they want it to sound, then everybody would be, you know, virtuosos. But it's, it's just getting your, your mind and your hands to do mm -hmm. what you're hearing in your mind um, that makes you really good. You know, you just have to work and work and work. And I think we forget that often in our spiritual lives. Now, just because we understand a concept about what God wants of us or how God wants us to be, um, it doesn't just happen because we go, oh, yeah, that's it. You know, we can even have these really deep insights and feel a strong feeling about it, but we don't automatically become a patient or automatically become a good listener or automatically become whatever it is. It takes practice and Learning to be with people who are suffering takes practice. And I think it takes the practice of doing it with people, but also the practice we can do in our own lives of spending time in prayer, spending time in meditation, spending time um, listening to God in our own hearts on our own, so that then when we're with people, we already, we already have that skill, if you want to call it a skill. You know, it's, it's part of us. It's not just like a technique we learned. It's part of who we are becoming. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it sounds like this is a long haul spiritual formation, ongoing thing. It's not a push a button and mm -hmm. say this, you know, a, a few bullet points that we memorize to speak into someone. We, it's really an ongoing thing, right? Right, right. And that doesn't mean God won't use whatever efforts we have right now. He will. Um, but I think if we want to really be there with people, we got to look at, okay, what kind of person do I need to be to be able to offer this to people? Okay. So we got that. We got that. That's, uh, that's good. However, I know what I need. I know some of my people need some practical how to's right. <laughs> in the meantime, as we're growing, as we're trying to, uh, grow in our understanding of, of grief and our relationship with God and all these things, being quiet and meditating and listening. What about today? What about tomorrow? What are some practical things we can do? Yeah. Yeah. And even though, you know, I think I said, use the word technique earlier, it's not like you can just learn a technique, <laughs> um, but everything has to be practical at some point because otherwise it's just an idea. It just stays abstract. And so um, I would say, you know, I didn't think about this earlier, but there are just some really good books out there now about growing in spiritual disciplines that could be helpful to somebody that's wanting to grow in the ways we're talking about. And maybe later we could get those to people or something. Um, but I can just share some of what I do, like in my own counseling practice, realizing that not everybody's gonna be a counselor, but I think some of this can be helpful to anybody that is wanting to just be there for people. 
Um, so one thing I do in my office is I have a candle that I keep in there all the time. And I light it every day before clients start arriving. And when I light it, I say a prayer just for every client that's going to be there that day. And then throughout the day, seeing that flame burning um, is such a powerful reminder that like God is here with us. This isn't just me and this person. God is here. And I have given this over to him. You know, I pray for them when I light it. And these people are loved by God. He knows them better than I ever will. He knows their stories already that I'm just learning. He is working in their lives already to whatever extent they've invited him to do that. So this isn't up to me. Um, I'm just one part of this much bigger thing that God is doing in people's lives. And so that, that visible reminder of that can be so helpful. And especially when someone's pain is really deep, you know, it, it hurts to hear that. It does. And so having that reminder helps me stay grounded in God's big enough for this and God's love is part of this. And when I blow it out at the end of the day, I, again, with prayer, just, you know, say, this is in your hands and I'm leaving it here. I'm going on to my life now, you know, and uh, that's become a really helpful thing. And so not everybody's going to carry a candle around, you know, to encounter people, but anything you can do, you know, it might be a cross in your pocket. It might be, um, anything, a bracelet that you wear, but something that's a reminder to you that God is with you and God is working in that person's life can really be helpful when you're in the place of needing to sit quietly with people and absorb a lot of pain. Um, another thing that I've learned to do, and it's not my idea or anything, but it's just when things are really hard to listen to, um, it's just to, I don't know if my hands will show, but you know, to, to turn your hands up so that and I don't sit there with my hands like that with people, but in my lap, you know, just the simple act of turning my palms up or even just one hand palm up um, is really helpful. It's like a symbolic way of saying, I don't need to hold on to this. I'm opening it up, giving it to God. I'm staying open to God's being here with us and whatever wisdom he might give me or whatever I need, you know, for this time. Um, it's a way of really calming your body down because it, it has that effect. You know, we are physical beings and the things we do with our bodies affect our mind and our heart. And so that's one thing is just, just putting your palms up uh, can be a powerful way to connect with God in the midst of someone's pain. And, um, and then another thing that is very basic, but it's very easy to forget, is that your breathing can be a really helpful way to be reminded, you know, God's spirit lives in you. And God gives us all our breath. He created us and he sustains us with, with every breath. And so just paying attention to the act of breathing, it, it calms your body down, it calms your mind down. And it, for believers, it, you know, it can give you a really deeper sense of connection to God. So those are three very practical things that I do um, in my work that have carried over you know, into my life too. Is that the sort of thing you had in mind or? That, that's very helpful. Um, you know, the palms up thing is something, it's a prayer really, right? It's a physical mm -hmm. prayer. You just, and you don't have to be obvious about it. Right. You just in the moment you're asking for discernment. You're asking to hear God's voice. Even while someone is crying or talking to you, you don't, we don't know what to say. We don't want to say something stupid or something out of our own uh, power. We want to speak with God's power. So mm -hmm. it's a continual receiving, right? Right, right. It's a receiving and a letting go. Both. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm not sure I'm going to carry a candle around everywhere I go. No, no, I don't think no. so. <laughs> but, you know, we want to be there for when others are suffering. We want to be silent when we need to be silent. We need to listen. We want to uh, speak when it's time to speak. We want to uh, receive and let go of our own control of the, of the situation to turn things continually over to God, to breathe in, and breathe out, and let those be like breath prayers mm -hmm. of surrender, breath prayers of um, asking for discernment. Um, but how can we, or can we, prepare for future suffering? Yeah, I have thought about that since you, you told me, you know, we might be talking about that. Um, and I'll just share, first of all, um, a story. Uh, when this pandemic hit in March, um, 
I had already been reading a good bit about it, so I kind of early on knew this is a big deal. We don't know how big it will be, but it's not going to be quick. It's going to take a long time. And um, and I, I used to live in Italy, and so I was reading a lot of the news from Italy, and it was just heartbreaking. It was so, so sad. And I have friends in Italy in that hot spot area and was very concerned because they got sick. And, you know, so this was a lot the first month. And then there was an earthquake in Croatia. <laughs> so we had a lot going on. And, um, and I think it was the week of the earthquake. A friend of mine um, just told me, she said, Sheila, I got permission for us to go in the church and pray if you want to. They're going to, like the janitor's going to be there and they're going to let us in if we want to go because the church had already been closed, you know. And so I was able to go with her, and this is an Orthodox church. And so the, the walls are all, and the ceiling too, but especially the walls are just completely covered in icons. There's just not really a space where you don't see some saint from the past or angel. And um, I'll never forget that, being there that morning. Uh, we had a little time together, and then we each had time on our own. And it was so helpful and so powerful. And it connects to what you're asking, you know, how do we prepare for suffering? Because I, I was doing that the whole month of March, you know, like what on earth lies ahead and how do we get ready for it? And, and how do we help ourselves and others through it, you know? And looking around at all of these icons of Christian believers who had lived in earlier centuries, um, and these, it's because they're Orthodox, it was, you know, from the Middle Ages and earlier, uh, it wasn't Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but it was earlier people. And so you realize, you know, some of these people lived through plagues and um, some of them probably lived through the bubonic plague and um, and they held on to their faith and I'm sure they helped the people in their lives, you know, and um, I don't know, I don't know how to put it into words. There was something just really powerful about that and realizing we are part of this really, really big picture and this really, really big church, and um, whatever suffering lies ahead for us, it, it will not be worse than something others have already been through, and actually with all our modern aids, it probably won't be as bad, you know, um, but uh, that was very powerful, and it has made me just think about how important it is to keep the really big picture in mind, and to think back and to read, I mean, to find the stories of the saints who've gone before us, either in scripture or since um, scripture was written, because there are so many powerful stories of people living through suffering and martyrs, you know, suffering and dying. Um, and you can see so much beauty in their lives and you get courage from that. So that's something that's been really, really helpful to me. And also in that time, um, did you see that movie, A Hidden Life? It came out, I think, in maybe December. Uh, no. What, oh, what's it about? Okay. You need to see it. A Hidden Life. It's a Terrence Malick film, and it's about a man named Franz Jägerstatter. I don't know how you say his name, but um, he lived during the, the time of the Nazi occupation of Austria. He was Austrian, and he was a believer, and he just realized that he could not take that oath of allegiance to Hitler and fight in the army, and he knew he was likely to be drafted, and so he um, spent a lot of time really preparing himself to refuse that, knowing that it would probably lead to his death, and it did. He was killed by guillotine, and um, it's a sad story, but it's a beautiful story and a beautiful film, and so I was reading the book of his letters between him and his wife, and then journal writings that he did, before he died, and several of them were written from the prison. Um, he was able to get paper and write from the prison. And so that was just, it has nothing to do with pandemic, really. It was like a different kind of virus, the virus of Nazism. Um, but just seeing the courage that he had, it just put a lot of things in perspective for me. And, you know, and I just thought, whatever lies ahead, God will get us through it, you know, and I need to be courageous and strong. And um, and so, yeah, that just to say that I think being more grounded in the stories of others who've gone before us can be a very powerful way to help us be ready for suffering and to be courageous in suffering and to encourage others too. Um, that's been a big thing. And then also I was going to share that 
um, after we lived through that war in Croatia, um, it was pretty devastating for me, especially just because I didn't know the language when I moved there. So it was a new language, a new culture, a new marriage, <laughs> and a war all together. And so it was a really, really hard time. Um, and there was a time period in my life after that, that I really struggled with Psalm 121 and Psalm 23, which had always been important to me. But I would think, you know, well, God didn't protect me and God let terrible things happen and he let me go into it, you know, and, and so I just really struggled with those, those two Psalms. And then at some point in the 2000s, <laughs> which we're still in, I know, but in that, in last, the last decade, um, I heard a song by John Michael Talbot and it's a setting of Psalm 121. So before you get to that, yes. can you give us a line or two from Psalm 121 that yeah, yeah. Uh, the way I had memorized it as a child was, the Lord will keep you from all evil. Um, he will keep your life. That's how the version I had said it. And he'll watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. It's a beautiful, beautiful psalm. But that, that line that the Lord will keep you from all evil, or he'll guard you from all evil, you, you hear it translated different ways. I just thought, but he didn't, you know, and like, how do I trust him? And um, Anyway, John Michael's way of singing that was, the Lord will guard you from all evil. He will guard your heart and your soul. He will guard your going and your coming now and forevermore. So he added that little bit about, or he changed it a little bit, you know, but guarding your heart and your soul. But what I realized after hearing that song over and over was God did guard my heart and my soul, and he did protect me from evil. He didn't protect me from the effects of evil, like war, you know, or like trauma. Um, but my heart and my soul were not conquered by evil. You know, I didn't become evil. I didn't become cynical. I didn't become hateful. I didn't become despairing. Um, he got me through all that. And, and that really changed the way I thought about that scripture and also uh, the Lord's Prayer where we pray, um, I just went blank. Deliver us. What is, oh, I have it written down. Deliver us from evil. Yeah. Um, De deliver us from temptation or. Right, right. We ask, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Yeah. Um, and I, I think much of my life, I thought that meant like, please keep bad things from happening to me. And, um, and at this point in my life, I'm like, bad things are going to happen to everybody. Terrible things are going to happen to a lot of people. But delivering us from evil, I really do believe, means don't let me become part of evil. Don't let me give in to evil. Don't let me um, succumb to evil, you know. And it really is amazing to think how God is able to do that. He, he works invisibly in our minds and in our hearts and in our relationships to provide that kind of protection so someone like Franz Jägerstatter can live through the horrors of the Nazi stuff and, and the prison and the way he was treated and everything. And that man did not even condemn his, his, the people that killed him. He said, you know, they probably haven't been given the graces that I've been given and they, they may not even realize what they're doing. You know, he just um, really had spent a lot of time with Jesus and he was not in any way overcome by evil, even though he'd lost his life. Yeah. That reminds me of last week we were talking about, uh, the idea that God wins, that mm -hmm. Jesus reigns supreme. And we talked about some of the martyrs in the first century and the way they died, mm -hmm. uh, whether it was through, uh, you know, persecution being thrown in the arena or whatever, that there's so much testimony about how they died and they died singing hymns and they right. died forgiving the people who were doing this to them. Mm -hmm. They did not succumb to evil. Exactly. That's neat. I had no idea you talked about that. So that's, kind of how the Holy Spirit seems to work. <laughs> um, yeah, I just think there is so much to that in, in our own wanting to be prepared for future suffering. It, it takes away the deeper fear that we would have. You know, I think it's, we're always naturally going to have some level of fear and anxiety just because we are physical beings that have that instinct, you know, but um, we don't have to live in a existential fear of what might happen you know we can truly trust that whatever may happen god will provide what we need when we need it so um 
And that, that comes back again to the music of just the idea that eventually he is going to bring all of this into some glorious, incredibly beautiful ending. And he wins. <laughs> and and it, it will be beautiful. Um, you know, I, I realized that I haven't said much at all about nature, but I think that spending time in nature connects with all this for me a lot because... Um, and it's interesting if you if you look at the the classics way back, they wrote about music as being very connected to nature. The music of the spheres. We have that phrase in the song, "This is my father's world." And, and nature it really was, sings and round me rings the music of yeah. the spheres. That one. That's the one. That's the one. And um, they had this idea that this belief that our ability to make music is connected to mathematical principles that are present in the cosmos that God created. And so all of nature and music are connected and they're connected through mathematics. It's, it's fascinating to, to read about all that. But, um, but even without all that, you know, nature is God's creation and we can learn so much from it. And it can be so encouraging and fortifying because you see in nature that the seasons come and seasons go and, um, you know, tornadoes come. I grew up in Arkansas. We had lots of tornadoes. We still do. Um, and they can be terrible. Uh, and yet what they do to, to nature itself, it always grows back. It always recovers. It always, there will be new little critters, you know, coming along and new flowers and trees. And um, there's just something really, really important, I think, about staying connected to nature when we talk about suffering. Because... I think the spring has been really encouraging to a lot of people with this pandemic hitting, you know, it's like, yeah, the virus is, is hurting and killing people. And yet there's all this beauty all around and we know spring will come again next year and that ultimately we're in God's hands and we'll be all right. At one point when I was reflecting on all this and just, you know, praying and thinking about it, um, lines, a line came into my mind, um, that I, I couldn't for a while figure out where did that come from, but it was, and sanctify to be thy deepest distress. And, you know, I just grew up singing old hymns, so it comes to me in the King James Version, um, because those are the lines of this hymn. And the tune came to me, and I was like, oh, oh, what is that hymn? <laughs> and I finally, I could sing the tune, but I couldn't remember, like, what's one of the first words of it? But it is the hymn, How Firm a Foundation. And um, it's a beautiful, beautiful hymn, but it has that, that one line. I'll, I'll just read that, that verse. When through the deep waters I cause thee to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with thee, thy troubles to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. And that's where that line came from. And that's one of my favorite passages and I've lived long enough now to be able to look back and say, yeah, the deepest suffering I have gone through, he has sanctified it. He has made something holy from it. And he mm. has done amazingly good things through that suffering. And it's a mystery. I mean, God moves in mysterious ways. We cannot explain it. We can't figure out providence and time and eternity and good and evil and I'm not saying we shouldn't try to think about them, but we will never understand it all completely um, because we are teeny tiny people and he is a big, incredible God. Um, but he does do that. And if, if you live long enough, you probably like this song. Yeah. <laughs> it's powerful. Well, good. Um, can you kind of tie this up in a neat bow? And what are, what are those? Let's go over those, those thoughts again. Uh, some of the things you talked about. Uh, we got to make time for silence, all right? We got to be alone with God to, as part of our spiritual formation process. Uh, what else? Let's, let's wrap it up here. What other things you will remind us about? Well, I think working, I didn't really emphasize this, I guess, but in that silence, developing practices that help you to develop an ongoing connection to God and just um, practicing the presence of God, as one book is called. Um, is is hugely important. So developing practices for silence and practices that keep us connected more deeply to God. And remembering the big picture. I think that's a really important part. And that 
what we're going through can feel and be very big, um, but it's part of a much bigger picture. And so the more we can do to learn from people from the past and to keep the final ending in mind, it helps us through our own suffering in the moment. That's some good stuff right there. And yeah. spend time in nature and listen to good music. <laughs> yeah. And we could have a whole Zoom meeting on defining good music. <laughs> <laughs> we could. Because <laughs> I know. To music that gets you closer to God. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Because <laughs> we have all to have different preferences because I know uh, some folks like classical music, some folks like uh, country music. And mm -hmm. I know Lido, if Lido's on here today, he loves some good old Gaither uh, gospel singing. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you so much, Sheila, for giving us your time and your thoughts and sharing your wisdom and experience with us. Well, and, thank you uh, for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I know our people appreciate it. And I know your uh, clients and friends are really going to miss you when you guys move back to Croatia. And uh, so uh, tell us just real briefly, you're moving to Croatia because. Well, we always intended to live our life there. Um, had that war not happened, we would have lived our life in Croatia. Um, so we've always planned to go back and we feel like that's where we need to live part of our life at least. And my in-laws are still there and so we want to go be with them. That's a big part of it. We have family yeah. and friends there. We're really thankful. Well, and we're really thankful that you joined us today. So thanks so much. And we, I'll end us in, uh, with a prayer. Okay. Lord, thank you so much for Sheila being with us today. And we do pray your blessings on, on her and her family as they move to Croatia. And uh, you will see that happen and happen soon. Uh, we bless, uh, ask you to bless the selling of their house and everything else that needs to happen before they can make this move. I pray, Lord, that she will find a way to minister over there just as she has here and help so many people. And I wish I could mention some of the names that I know about of people that have gone to Sheila and had received such blessings from her uh, in a, in a client counselor relationship. And I know that those people are, are very blessed to have Sheila in their life. And they're also sad that, that she's moving. And uh, so we ask your blessings, Lord, and uh, on all her clients that they can find a new trusted person to go to and talk to ask your blessings on their family. Thank you so much, Lord. Help us to, to learn what it means to prepare for suffering for ourselves and the long road of spiritual formation and help us to understand that it's not a, a push a button thing and have uh, a few answers ready to go and, and know exactly what to say, but it's a spiritual formation process that takes time that we really have to spend with the Lord and listen to the spirit. Help us to do that, God, especially those of us like me with ADHD who uh, are not used to silence and we're not used to slowing down. We're not used to listening. We need your help, God. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All righty. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye-bye.